I hope so. We're going to finish sensory systems and then go and begin learning at memory. I hope this is recording properly. Okay. And we're going to do the auditory system today, uh, and then we will do the somatosensory system on Wednesday, and learning and memory uh, subsequently. These are going to be, so remember we had three lectures on the visual system, um, and there's a good reason for that, because we know uh, a lot about the visual system. We know a fair amount about these other systems as well, uh, but we only have one lecture on them. And so the lectures are going to um, cover a lot of, uh, survey a lot of terrain, and it really uh, will help you if you take a look at the chapters, read the chapters before the lecture, uh, if at all possible, uh, and certainly take a look at the PDFs. They're all posted for this week uh, for these lectures. Uh, but so the lectures are more intended, well, they're going to give you an overview and they'll help, uh, hopefully, to anchor uh, the material that you're going to uh, dive into in more detail in the readings. And then, as usual, here we have some important points. So when you look at this uh, slide here, uh, you should be, uh, certainly after listening to the lecture and doing the reading, uh, you should all of these should click and make sense to you, and you should be able to elaborate uh, on these points, many of which are points that we would uh, think about when we compose um, problem sets, and for that matter, questions on the final, which will emphasize the latter half of the, will emphasize those lectures that were not uh, incorporated into the midterm, including these ones here. So you saw this slide before, um, that uh, Sherrington, in his book, The Integrative Action of the Nervous System, classified sensory modalities in a couple of different ways, uh, and hearing is together with vision under teleroception, so just like vision, it's not something that's actually impacting uh, directly. The, the stimulus about that you want to represent isn't directly impacting the body surface, nor is it internal to you. You're not you know, eating it or smelling it. It's out there in the world, and you can only know about it indirectly, which means that you need to make a whole bunch of inferences about it. Uh, they're often ill-posed, and so your brain has developed a bunch of heuristics and clever mechanisms to uh, try and make them less ill-posed. But the problem is uh, similar, um, as we'll see. And what we're going to do is go through the anatomy. So we'll basically walk, so, you know, in, in for the visual lectures, they were sort of divided, and we spent some time talking about the eye and the retina, some time talking about uh, visual cortex and object recognition and so forth. Here, we're going to go through the whole auditory system, since there's just one lecture on it. Um, say a little bit about human language, and say a little bit about uh, some model systems that uh, should get you to think about making comparisons between sensory modalities and comparisons uh, across species. So one thing that you should start thinking about as we go through all these different sensory systems is what are the basic, in the sort of David Marr framework that we uh, uh, looked at once, what are the basic computational <coughs> problems that organisms uh, want to solve? What are the algorithms that evolution has come up with and how is that implemented, often quite idiosyncratically, in different nervous systems? And we have this slide up before, and so the same kind of processing that uh, we talked about when we spoke about vision applies to audition, and indeed applies to somatosensation. And so you can go through the same kinds of processing steps, and at each step you can uh, begin to make some comparisons, as I mentioned, uh, similarity, look, at, look for similarities and differences between different uh, sensory modalities. But just like in the case of vision, first there's a sound coming in. So just like there was light that was reflecting of an object out there in the world, it hits the retina, and your brain then needs to do something in order to reconstruct the distal properties of the object. What is it? Where is it located? Uh, just from the light that it's um, reflecting. Same thing for sound. Sound is being emitted by an object out there in the world. It hits your cochlea. And from that, you need to reconstruct something about what kind of an object is emitting that sound and where in space might be located. Very similar problems. And so there's similar kinds of stages of processing. There would be some early processing that you could assess with tasks that look at simple detection or discrimination of auditory stimuli. More complex ones would ask you to identify stimuli, to recognize them, recognize a certain voice or a word uh, for which you need memory to some extent. And on the basis of that, then you can take an action and uh, interact with the world. <coughs> 
So the similarities, um, just to quickly go through them, both audition and vision and somatic sensation have processing streams, which means that different attributes of a stimulus, to some extent, are processed uh, in functionally and indeed anatomically different processing streams in the brain. So remember, we have the dorsal and the ventral streams concerned with representing where in space visual objects were located and their identity. There's something similar in the auditory system. Just like with the visual system, there's a topographic map. Uh, there's a cochleotopic uh, map in the auditory system. The cochlea, as we'll see, is, the, is what transduces sound into electrical potentials. And so there's a map of the cochlea, which turns out to be a map of frequency in the auditory system. And there are also other more complicated maps that we'll take a look at. Those maps, just like in the visual system, have some distortion and magnification. Remember, in the visual system, we had a map of visual space in primary visual cortex. That's just a consequence or was sort of carried forward from the optics of the eye and the map at the level of the retina. But it magnified the fovea, because that's where you do most, where you have the highest visual acuity and you do most of your processing. Same thing here. So there's uh, a tonotopic map in the brain, but there's over-representation of certain frequencies uh, that carry the most information. For instance, the ones concerned with speech. You need to make inferences, uh, comparisons, um, and so all these points that we had in the case of vision apply to audition. Um, and then there's, there's both of these, also we didn't really mention this too much, have very important developmental components and plasticity. Um, so in the case of the visual system, you need we didn't have time to go into this, but you need visual experience uh, in order to be able to see normally. And people have actually done very interesting studies in humans, for instance, in human patients that have been blind from birth, but then surgically had restored their vision. And they can't see normally uh, when you do that. So there's something that's essential that needs to happen uh, early in development in order to have normal vision. And the same is true of audition. In the case of audition, it's pretty obvious if you have to learn a second language, once you're, say, my age, it's really hard. And so there's something, uh, there's certain uh, plastic periods early in development that, for instance, make language learning much easier than is the case later on. And just like with vision, both of these sensory modalities play very important roles in social communication in many species. Uh, so in our, so you could say there's you know, face processing, looking at people's actions, etc. In the case of vision, it serves an important role in social communication and what you say and the prosody of your voice as well. And of course, in other species, it would be songs that birds sing um, and you know, cats and dogs, all mammals uh, have this. There are important differences as well. So in addition to the similarity, it's worth thinking about the differences. And we'll see these when we go through, just to quickly uh, go through them. Remember that, that visual transduction in the retina at the level of photoreceptors was quite slow, in good part due to the fact that second messengers were involved. It's extremely fast in the case of the auditory system because there's a directly mechanically gated ion channel that transduces the vibrations of sound into changes in electrical potential, potassium and calcium fluxes. So transduction, right at the transduction uh, step, there's a huge temporal difference in temporal acuity. So that's reflected here. Spatial acuity, by contrast, is pretty low in the auditory system compared to the visual system. So in the visual system, it's like a minute arc of arc uh, in terms of acuity that you can tell visual stimuli apart if you foveate them. And it's several degrees or so uh, in the case of auditory stimuli. So auditory system has much better temporal acuity, much worse spatial acuity than the visual system, quite complementary. As we'll see, there's feedback to the cochlea. Remember, there was none to the retina. Um, and then there's other uh, things. One big difference that we'll see that's really worth pointing out here already is that the number of receptors, remember in the retina, we had 100 million or so photoreceptors, most of them rods, and about 1 million retinal ganglion cells that sent axons into the brain. So a massive convergence of photoreceptors onto retinal ganglion cells resulting in very high sensitivity even to faint light that you can see out of the corner of your eye when you see a star that rods are responsible for. In the case of the auditory system, you only have uh, actually about, only about 3,000 or so inner hair cells, as we'll see, that actually do most of the work in transducing sound. Those converge onto a larger, somewhat larger number of second-order neurons. But the number of uh, sensory receptors is tiny 
in the auditory system compared to the visual system. Very, very different. There are other similarities in that, as you remember, all sensory modalities, with the exception of smell, have an obligatory relay in a thalamic sensory nucleus before they get to their primary sensory cortex. So in the case of the visual system, the retina projected to the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus, and that went on to primary visual cortex, V1, Bartman's area 17. In the case of the auditory system, it also goes to the thalamus, but not directly. So there's first some more complex processing, as we'll see in midbrain nuclei. So to some extent, you could think of all this midbrain processing in the case of the auditory system as being functionally analogous to the processing that goes on in the retina in the case of the visual system. And then that highly processed information goes to the thalamic auditory nucleus, which is called the medial geniculate nucleus. So it's just medial to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then that projects to primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. Okay, so since you guys uh, remember what we had in the case of vision, uh, does anybody want to give me an answer to the analogous question in the case of audition? So what's, what is hearing? What would the sort of David Marr version of an answer be to this, Olivia? Perfect. I think it's probably there in your PDF as well. But um, right, uh, yes, to know what is where by listening, um, and so this it's really quite uh, analogous, and it makes the same functional points uh, as the answer to vision that we had before. So as the case with vision, audition is active to some extent. In some animals, it's very active because they can move their ears around. Hopefully, you're not so good at moving your ears around, but you move your head around. And uh, even if you cannot move your ears, you can shift how you allocate attention. So for instance, if you're at a party and there's lots of noise around, you can choose to pay attention to a certain person. So there's, there's certainly some active filtering. So there's listening here, so audition is active. And of course, in some animals, like bats, that echolocate, it's extremely active. And then you need to recover the same kind of information about distal stimuli. You need to know what is what, what a sound is. Is that a person screaming or an animal roaring or a water tap dripping or whatever? You need to identify it and you want to know where it's coming from. So same kinds of problems. Um, here are just some quick um, facts here. So you can judge if it's a complete dark room depending on the sound and you've probably all experienced this. If there's like, you know, a high-pitched whine uh, coming from old TVs or something like that it can often, or a low buzz, that can often be very difficult to localize in space. But if you have a spectrally complex sound, like somebody's voice, you can localize it fairly well, but as, as we mentioned, not nearly as well in space as you can localize visual stimuli with foveation in the visual system. So one question is, how does that work? Um, how can you localize sounds? We'll take a look at the mechanisms for that. And that's actually one uh, important aspect of audition that invariably will crop up on a problem set or exam. So make sure you know. Uh, you can discriminate between frequencies over a very large dynamic range, and you can discriminate between sound intensity also over a very large dynamic range. And the, the challenges here, again, are quite similar to what we had in the visual system. In the visual system, for instance, you need to be able to tell apart very faint differences in luminance over an even larger dynamic range, about 10 orders of magnitude between a dark room and a bright sunlit you know, ski slope or something like that. And remember that the mechanism, that you can't do that if all you have is one mechanism. It's impossible to have that kind of discrimination over that large a dynamic range. Instead, you need active mechanisms of adaptation. And there were a bunch that we talked about in the visual system, and indeed there are several in the auditory system as well. So how does this look? Uh, graphically here, here is a log-log plot of how well you are able to hear very faint sounds at different frequencies. So the frequencies are down here in the x-axis, and on the y-axis is sound intensity, which is typically plotted in decibels sound pressure levels, dBSPL. This is a logarithmic plot of the ratio of the intensity of the sound you're hearing relative to a reference sound level, which people have fixed at 20 micropascals, which is sort of the quietest sound that you can normally hear. And your thresholds here are, um, is this curve. This human curve is the, is the uh, solid one. By comparison, here's a cat. And so uh, uh, sound intensities at a given frequency that are below this curve are inaudible and above this curve 
you can hear. Up here it gets dangerous and loud, and you would burst your eardrum if you have something of on the order of 140 decibels or so. Speech is sort of in the middle. There's a couple of other things uh, thrown in here. So you will see right away that you are most sensitive, you are able to hear the quietest sounds at frequencies of about 4 kilohertz, 3 or 4 kilohertz, which happens to be uh, the um, frequency at which there is the most energy in human speech. And so one uh, reason people think that you are sensitive, you have the greatest sensitivity at this frequency, is, in or is for, that, uh, for that reason. Here's some other um, curves for other animals to give you an idea. So some are very good at low frequency hearing, elephants and so forth. And there's many mammals that have a uh, higher frequency sensitivity than do humans. So humans are the, are the solid line here. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones. And as you probably know, many of them, dogs, cats, mice, um, dolphins, of course, bats, uh, can hear at much higher frequencies that are ultrasonic uh, to us. Uh, just like bees can see at, uh, at um, different wavelengths, shorter wavelengths, than we can. Okay, so let's, so any questions about this quick sort of survey, uh, sort of functional survey of audition? And now we're going to go into the brain and take a look at the components of that, which are all illustrated here. So we're going to walk our way through these a step at a time, starting with the... Uh, uh, the pinna, the external ear. So animals often have very large, very specialized ears, and many mammals, of course, can move their ears. So there's very active processes going on right away. If you watch, for instance, I have cats at home. If you watch cats, their ears are always moving. They're always moving around, doing some very complex active filtering of sounds. Um, you generally can't move your ears too much, uh, but the folds in your ear already do quite complex um, spectral filtering. And so if you ask what's the transfer function of the external ear, that is, to what extent does it increase or decrease the amplitude of sounds as a function of their frequency, uh, this is quite complex, and this is idiosyncratic to each person's ear. So if you've got another person's ear stuck onto your head, it would take a while for your brain to adapt, and initially it would sound really weird. You can, of course, simulate this if you just squash your ears around and things will, will sound weird and it will be difficult for you to localize them as well. So there's a bunch of stuff, a bunch of complex spatially uh, selective, directionally selective spectral filtering that occurs because of the folds in your ear. Also, it to some extent amplifies sounds, so it's like a, just a big funnel that funnels sound waves in. So it serves a couple of different functions. So that's the external ear. The middle ear, down here, is still filled with air. This is the part that, that hurts or can get infected uh, if you have a cold and your, you, your, um, your station tubes get plugged. So this, it's very small here, we'll expand it in just a second. It's separated from the, um, the uh, outer ear here by the eardrum. So the eardrum is this green thing, that's where sound waves first hit uh, some tissue, they cause it to vibrate, then there's further vibrations in the middle ear here. We'll take a look at that. There's little bones in here, still air-filled. And then sensory transduction happens in the inner ear. That's this blue thing. And uh, as is illustrated here, it's a little small to see, the blue thing consists of this snail-like part that's called the cochlea that has the uh, cells that transduce mechanical vibrations of sound into electrical potential. That's the first place that happens is in the cochlea, is where auditory sensory transduction happens. In addition, there are these little loops here that you can see, which are the vestibular labyrinths. We don't have time to talk about that sensory modality in this course, but these are responsible for your sense of balance. And so they also detect mechanical stimuli. The cochlea detects very small, fast mechanical vibrations due to sound. The vestibular labyrinths, which have similar kinds of cells, uh, detect uh, different grosser kinds of mechanical shearing movements that are due to gravity and acceleration. And so how you rotate and move in space uh, will stimulate those cells and allows you to keep your sense of balance. So if you lose those, the labyrinths, you lose your sense of balance. You tip over and start vomiting, get really nauseated, and your eyes go back and forth, and you're in bad shape. If you lose this, the cochlea, uh, you're not deaf unless it's on both sides, but you're deaf in one ear. 
if you cut the eighth nerve completely, you would have both. So the eighth cranial nerve, this blue thing here, has two branches. One is auditory, that gives, you, gives your brain input from the cochlea, and the other is vestibular, that gives your brain input about your sense of balance. After that, there's second-order neurons whose cell bodies are located in the spiral ganglion. These are bipolar cells that send axons into the brainstem. There's processing in the brainstem that we'll take a look at. Uh, and the main thing you need to know, the only thing you need to know about the processing in the brainstem is that that is the first place that begins to make binaural comparisons. So it makes comparisons between the sounds from the left and the right ear. And that's essential for you to localize sounds in space. Once that's done, it goes on up to the thalamus, or the inferior colliculus first, sorry, then the thalamus, finally the medial geniculate nucleus, and then to primary auditory cortex. Okay, so that's the whole um, setup. Okay, so let's take a look at this in more detail. So again, here is the external ear, which spectrally filters sounds. Here's the eardrum in blue, the middle ear filled with air, and the cochlea that is filled with a fluid that does the sensory transduction and then there's the auditory nerve going into the brain. Let's take a look at the middle ear. So the tympanic membrane, sound first hits this, and it vibrates. This is your eardrum. So if you have a gunshot going off next to your ear, this is what you will rupture if there's too loud a sound hitting this. The um, middle ear has three bones, whose names are listed here, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And the first, so basically they, tr they transfer the vibrations of the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, to the vibrations of another membrane called the oval window. The tympanic membrane separates two partitions that are filled with air, the outside here going into your outside ear, and the middle ear, which is also full with air. The oval window separates one partition that is filled with air, the middle ear, and one partition that's filled with fluid, which is in the cochlea here, your inner ear. Because of that, there's a big impedance mismatch, because fluid is much less compressible than is air. And in part for that reason, the, surf, the ratio of the surface areas of the oval window to the tympanic membrane uh, amplifies the sound. Okay, so the tympanic membrane, I think, has something like 50 times the surface area of the oval window. And because of that, you can put a much, the foot plate, which is this bony thing here, of this little bone, the stapes, can put a much greater pressure onto this membrane, the oval window, that then bulges into the cochlea, which is filled with fluid, much stronger pressure than you have per given surface area at the tympanic membrane. In addition, these little bones also, uh, because of the sort of lever action, amplify the um, mechanical vibrations. So you have mechanical uh, amplification whoops, uh, in the middle ear for at least two reasons. One is the leverage of the bones, and the other is the relative ratios of the surface areas of these two membranes, the tympanic membrane and the oval window. Any questions about that, that basic setup? Do you have a question? No, OK. Um, as we saw in the retina, where you had mechanisms for adaptation in case there was a very bright light, you have mechanisms, mechanical mechan more mechanical mechanisms for adaptation at multiple stages of auditory processing, but already beginning in the middle ear. And those are these little nerves shown here. So there's a nerve coming in to innervate a muscle on the stapedius and another one up here. If there's a really loud sound, there's a reflex from these nerves to these muscles, such that these muscles pull these little bones away from the tympanic membrane or from the round window, and thus reduce the transfer of sound vibrations that might be harmful to your ear if it's very loud. Okay, I think that's... Oh, um, the other thing to point out is that um, in evolution, one thing that happened, and there's a, num there's a number of, of uh, special adaptations that happened in evolution, in particular in the evolution of mammals from, uh, that makes them different from reptiles and birds. Uh, in the case of reptiles, you only have one uh, ossicle, one of these little bones, uh, and we mammals have three, uh, as well as other specializations in the cochlea, uh, that one thing that they achieve is that mammals have hearing that extends into a higher frequency range than do reptiles. So reptiles can hear at lower frequencies, mammals at higher frequencies. The presumptive advantage in the evolution of that to mammals was that baby mammals, like little mice squeaking around, 
can transmit, uh, can make sounds, separation calls so their mother can find them, that are inaudible to reptile predators. So high frequency hearing and the ability to make uh, ultrasonic, what, what, what are to reptiles, ultrasonic sounds uh, arose in the evolution of mammals. And one invention, one mechanism for that, not the only one, was that uh, mammals had these three ossicles. Yes. The role of the facial nerve is the same as oh, uh, the role of the facial nerve. It's, it's the same as uh, the role of this nerve. So it's just, I mean, this nerve innervates lots of other muscles, uh, but uh, there's a branch. All the, the only thing that's shown here, there's a branch here that innervates this particular uh, muscle. So there's a branch from the facial nerve, and there's a brand, There's another nerve up here that uh, uh, innervate these muscles that pull the bones away, that's all. So there's two muscles. I don't think you need to know the details of these, but you just need to know that there are uh, adaptive mechanisms in the middle ear for very loud sounds. They're muscles that will pull these bones away from their respective membranes to attenuate very loud, harmful sounds. Okay, what happens next then? So this is, again, your tympanic membrane. The oval window up here, here's your three ossicles, and this then is the cochlea. So remember, this is this round thing that we saw before. It's a bony, snail-like uh, thing that's filled with fluid. And what they've done here is stretched it out. It consists of several partitions and membranes that have different uh, types of fluid. Endolymph here in the middle, which is very rich in potassium, and perilymph around the outside. And this membrane that separates these is kind of floppy and um, moves as a function of the vibrations that are set up by the sound coming in. So the sound comes in, the stapes vibrates on the oval window, it sets up vibrations in the fluid in the cochlea, and down here is another uh, window called the round window that just has a little membrane with nothing else on it, that whenever you push in with the bony footplate of the stapes, this can bulge out, so there's a place for the fluid to, to, uh, to, to go. The consequence of these vibrations is that they set up uh, waves, displacements, on this membrane, and the membrane is differentially stiff at different places in the cochlea, such that it is maximally displaced as a function of the frequency of the sound vibrations, and that's what's illustrated here. So the, this membrane is a spectral analyzer, it decomposes a spectrally complex sound into its constituent frequencies as a function of location. So it generates a tonotopic map. And so that's what's shown here. These are the uh, uh, frequencies, 20 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz, and so forth, at which there would be maximal displacement of this membrane in the cochlea. Okay, so you have a map of frequency at the place where sound is transduced in the cochlea. You don't have a map of auditory space. So remember, in the visual system, we had a map of visual space because of the optics of the eye. You don't have any information about auditory space here. You have information about how loud a sound is and its frequency. That's it. And so that's all along this membrane here. And so this is the way it works. As I just mentioned, you have vibrations coming in on the oval window, pushing out on the round window. And these set up these waves, the actual mechanical displacement of this membrane, and in this membrane are the, um, is, are the hair cells that transduce these vibrations into electrical potential, okay? So there's a tonotopic map that maps frequency on the cochlea. How does this look in detail? Well, uh, it's complicated, <laughs> but uh, here's how it works. You have uh, these hair cells. There's several different types of them. In particular, there's one row of inner hair cells three rows of outer hair cells, and overlying them is a floppy membrane called the tectorial membrane. As this part of the cochlea uh, maps frequency and is displaced, this tectorial membrane moves with respect to the hair cells. The hair cells are called hair cells because they have little hairs, little uh, cilia, little stereocilia, coming, little tufts coming out the top that just touch the tectorial membrane. If the tectorial membrane shears with respect to the hair cells, it shears these little stereocilia. There are mechanically gated channels in the stereocilia that are opened, and an electrical potential change results in the hair cell that's then transmitted into the brain. Okay, so that's how auditory transduction works. There's a couple of um, 
strange aspects to this. So one, as I mentioned, is that the number of uh, these sensory receptors, these hair cells, is tiny compared to the number of photoreceptors. Only about 3,000 inner hair cells per cochlea on each side. So that's tiny compared to the 100 million or so um, um, rods that you had in your retina. There are somewhat more, three times more or so, outer hair cells. But it turns out the outer hair cells actually do very little in terms of transducing sound into electrical potential and passing that on into the brain. Instead, very weirdly, and unlike anything in the retina, they do exactly the opposite. They get innervated by the brain, so there's efferent uh, input coming from the brain stem into the outer hair cells. It innervates them. They change their shape, and they actively change the frequency tuning of this region of the cochlea. In fact, when they do that, your ear can emit little sounds. So you can put an, a microphone into your ear, and your ear will actually have spontaneous autoacoustic emissions and put sound out because of these outer hair cells changing their shape and, and making my, uh, small mechanical movements. This is totally different than anything in the retina. Remember, there was no uh, input from the brain back out to the retina. Here we have massive efferent output back to the outer hair cells. So that's schematized here. Here's your row of inner hair cells, three rows of outer hair cells. The outer hair cells get mostly uh, input from the brain, from a nucleus in the brainstem called the superior olive. So that goes mostly to those. The inner hair cells instead send information into the brain. Now the inner hair cells don't yet make action potentials. They don't need to. As you can see, they're very short. They don't have axons. So they have graded potentials. But then there are these bipolar cells located in the spiral ganglion, so the second order neurons in the auditory system. And they make a lot of synapses, very specialized synapses, onto the hair cells. And that's where action potentials originate. And then they would go along these axons of these spiral ganglion cells into the brainstem. Okay, any questions about this uh, basic arrangement? So it's pretty strange and it's pretty different in many ways from the retina. There are many fewer uh, sensory receptors. In the retina, we had massive convergence of photoreceptors onto retinal ganglion cells, about 100 million rods, 1 million retinal ganglion cells. Um, here we have the opposite. We have a lot of divergence such that a single photoreceptor gives rise to lots of eighth nerve axons going into the brain, about 10 times that number. Question. Yes? Uh, could tinnitus be caused by this uh, outer, outer hair cell mechanism? Um, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. I think the answer is partially. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what all the causes of tinnitus are. I don't know that anybody knows. I know it's a big problem uh, when you have it. Um, I think that's part of it, but not all of it. Does anybody know more than that? So, yeah, I think that's part of it, but not all of it. Uh, these, these outer hair cells are also, by the way, susceptible to... Um, uh, to damage, for instance, if you take antibiotics, they can damage these outer hair cells. Um, okay, so uh, this just gives you the numbers here. So most, most eighth nerve fibers come from these inner hair cells. Okay, and so here's an EM just showing you how these look, arranged in the cochlea, inner hair cells with their little hairs, three rows of outer hair cells. And as I mentioned, what happens when the sound comes in, these have these little cilia that stick up into the tectorial membrane. This part of the cochlea shears, there's a wave set up there at a particular frequency. So if you happened to hit the sweet spot of the frequency that's mapped on that part of the cochlea, you would shear the tectorial membrane, they would bend these little hairs, uh, these mechanically gated channels would let potassium and calcium in, there would be changes in electrical potential in the inner hair cells and then action potentials that go on in the eighth nerve. And that's illustrated here, so when these are sheared, uh, you have electrical potential changes. In detail, how this looks is shown here. So there's, um, uh, these are polarized in the sense that the largest of these cilia, called the kinocilium, uh, determines the polarity. And if you shear, if you deflect these little uh, hairs in the direction of the kinocilium, you will depolarize the hair cell. In the opposite direct direction, you will hyperpolarize the hair cell. And that's shown here. So it's just schematized up here, and if you're recording uh, the receptor potential from a hair cell, and then if you're recording 
from the eighth nerve, these are the action potentials that you would see. This is uh, idealized. You know that you, I would have you tell me that these are not exactly how things would look. In particular, there would be habituation of these action potentials here. So there would be a fast burst, and then it would sort of slow down. But that's roughly how it works. Uh, let me move on here. There's lots known about the, the molecules involved. Um, there are extremely few of these mechanically gated channels, perhaps just one per stereocilium, just 100 or so per hair cell. Um, the identity of these has long been enigmatic. There's been several molecules that have been identified, but they vary from species to species. And in fact, it seems that they vary in terms of where on the cochlea you look at the hair cell. But they seem to belong to, uh, to some families, uh, like these transient receptor potential, uh, mechanically gated channels. So basically what, what you can think of, uh, it's like a little trap door, that when this gets deflected, there's a, a physical little link here, these tip links, and these open like a little trap door, these mechanically gated ion channels that allow ions to flow in to the hair cell in order to depolarize it. Okay, so... Let's move on uh, into the brain. There are different ways in which um, um, the auditory system can encode information about sounds. So if you're recording from an eighth nerve axon, one simple way is just by rate. So if something is louder, just like if a light is brighter, your rectal ganglion cells will fire more action potentials. If a touch is stronger, um, neurons in your somatosensory system will fire more. So that's a simple rate code, where rate encodes the intensity of sound. And then we've heard about already a place code, so where the identity of a particular neuron, of a particular axon, where it gets its information from the retina, that's a tonotopic, that's tonotopic information, that's a place code. And then in addition to that, um, because of their high temporal acuity, auditory neurons can encode something about the phase of a sound. So remember that the cochlea breaks a spectrally complex sound down into frequencies. And so particular hair cells and particular eighth nerve axons would only see input from a particular frequency because they're, they're innervated by one particular location in, at the cochlea. So here you have then a, uh, a particular frequency of a sound, and you have action potentials that would always be on a certain phase, on a certain cycle of this sinusoidal sound. Uh, and this, in us, goes up to about 4 kilohertz um, or so. Now, a single neuron couldn't fire on every single cycle because then its firing rate would be 4 kilohertz, and that wouldn't work given the refractory period of uh, action potentials. But if you had a whole bunch of them and they all had this property and you lined them up, the output from that ensemble could indeed reproduce uh, this sound cycle by cycle. Okay, so there's at least three codes. The rate, which is the intensity, the timing, which we'll talk about in just a second, is relevant for spatial localization of sounds, and the place where on the cochlea they get their information from that determines the frequency, that determines tonotopy. Okay? So let's talk about spatial audition. If you have a click coming in, so just a transient little sound, just a stick function coming in, it will hit your right, if it's over here on the right, this will hit your right ear slightly before the left ear, because there's some distance space between those, and the speed of sound isn't all that fast. The difference is pretty small, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's about 600 microseconds or so, but it turns out that your auditory system is uh, specialized in order to be able to encode that difference in the relative timing of a sound between the left and the right ears. So what I just described would make sense for a very transient, like a click, but if you have neurons, as I just showed you, that can uh, encode the particular phase of a sound, you can do the same thing with respect to um, uh, a continuous sinusoidal sound as well. So how this works, how, this, how a map that would encode in the brain where sounds are located in terms of their direction left or right, um, how that works is illustrated here. You have a sound that is close, that is over on your left. So the sound gets transduced in the left cochlea a few micro, hundred microseconds or so before it gets transduced by the right cochlea. So a very short temporal difference, but it comes in as an action potential traveling along the eighth nerve coming in from the left ear, slightly before one from the right ear. And what will happen is that that one from the left ear will then be over here, see by number five, it will have traveled a longer distance, 
than the action potential coming in from the right ear, which will only be over by number one. And so if you have a setup such that you have neurons here that will only fire if they get coincident input from axons from the left and from the right ear, you can set up a map that encodes where in space, in terms of left and right location, the sound is located. In this case, neuron E would fire if a sound is far over to the left. Neuron C would fire, would fire if a sound is exactly straight ahead and there's no temporal difference between left and right ears. Neuron A would fire if the, if the sound is way over to your right and gets transduced by the right cochlea before the left cochlea. Is that clear to everybody, that scheme? So take a look at the book. I mean, it walks you through this, but so this is uh, important to know. This um, encodes where sounds are located left and right in terms of binaural disparities between the left and the right ear in terms of the timing of sounds. You have something very similar in terms of the intensity of the sound. So if a sound is over on the left, not only does it arrive there first, but it's also louder in the left than in the right ear. And you have very something very similar where, uh, again, brainstem nuclei compare the uh, loudness of sounds coming from the left and from the right ear. And this relay is shown here. It goes, so this previous one, I didn't mention what this is, this MSO stands for medial superior olive. So there's a particular brainstem nuclei that gets input from the two cochlea that is concerned with uh, making comparisons in timing in order to figure out where sounds are located left or right. There's another one that involves these two, the lateral superior olive and the medial nucleus of the trapezoid body, um, and these compare the loudness between the two ears to achieve the same kind of thing, where sounds are located left and right. And so there's an inhibitory relay, so from one ear it goes through the medial nucleus of the trapezoid body, and there's an inhibitory relay from that ear then into the lateral superior olive, which gets excitatory input from the opposite ear, and if you put these two together, uh, one ear will win over the other and sharpen a tuning curve such that neurons here will fire depending on whether a sound is louder in the left or in the right ear. So both of these mechanisms happen in the brainstem. There are comparisons, there are mechanisms for making comparisons between the timing and the loudness in the two ears that allow you to figure out where sound sources are located uh, in azimuth, left to right. You might wonder, well, how do you figure out where sound sources are located in terms of elevation, up and down? That's more complicated. It depends on different animals solve that differently. In your case, it's very important to have those folds in your external ear. So the way that your external ears filter sounds that are coming from up or from down as a function of the frequency, they have to be spectrally complex sounds, uh, gives your brain information about where sound sources are located up and down. So from the brainstem on, on upward, you have a number of different kinds of information. You have information in terms of the loudness of the sound, of course. You have information that is passed on up through the stages, just like was the case with retinotopy in the visual system. You have cochleotopy, i.e. tonotopy, passed on. So there are always maps of the frequency of the sound going up. And from here going up, you now have information about the spatial location of sounds in terms of their relative timing or loudness between the two ears. So what happens when you get up to cortex? So remember, you go up. We've skipped through a couple of stages, but uh, from the brainstem, it goes up to the uh, inferior colliculus, then to the thalamus, and from the thalamus, it goes on to auditory cortex. Um, auditory cortices are located in the temporal lobe and shown here from this old picture that we had. And remember, in humans, which is what's illustrated here in part, um, a lot of this cortical, a lot of this cortex, higher order auditory cortex in the brain, uh, in most people, uh, preferentially on the left side, is concerned with processing auditory information about one particular kind of auditory stimulus, which is human speech. And so the way this looks in the human brain is shown here. Primary auditory cortex sits just up here. It's pretty small in the uh, lower bank of the sylvian fissure. There's a little gyrus here called Heschel's gyrus, and that's primary auditory cortex. If you dissect this away, you can look in and you can see it here. It's actually kind of, it's sort of similar to what we saw with primary visual cortex. You couldn't see that either, looking at the outside of the brain. You had to sort of look inside the calcarine sulcus, and there was primary visual cortex. Same thing here. It's buried inside the sylvian fissure, and if you dissect this away, 
you will see that there's a gyrus there, Heschel's gyrus, shown in red here. Um, actually, here's a better picture. Uh, I don't know if it's better, but uh, maybe it's more confusing, especially. This shows you where primary auditory cortex is located. Here's a human brain over here. Here's the front on the right. And what we're doing is prying apart the sylvian fissure so we can peer uh, on top of the planum temporale, which is this part here, the, the uh, bottom part of the sylvian fissure. That is the very dorsal aspect of the temporal lobe here, temporal cortex. And there is this little gyrus, Heschel's gyrus. That's primary auditory cortex. Um, let me skip these. Let me skip these parts here. It's probably not that necessary. Let me just mention that uh, one thing that's uh, been studied a lot in the human brain and that we don't have time to go into is how higher order auditory cortex in the temporal lobe then contributes to language processing. And there, are, uh, there's a lot to be said about that, but one important part is that human brains seem to have evolved uh, rapid pathways that transmit auditory processing that goes on in these higher order auditory cortices in the temporal lobe to premotor cortices up here that you heard about before in the Broca's area. So these areas in the temporal lobe are concerned with the receptive parts of speech that is being able to understand what another person says. These parts up here in Broca's area are concerned with the productive aspects of speech that is being able to talk. And so if you have a lesion up here in Broca's area, you can understand other people, but you have difficulty speaking yourself. If you have a lesion back here in Wernicke's area, which is higher order auditory cortex, both in all cases in the left hemisphere generally, if you have a lesion back here, you're unable to understand what people say, but you can still speak. If you have a lesion that uh, disconnects these two regions, you can understand people and you can speak, but you can't repeat what people say, for instance. So there's lots of interesting uh, disorders, collectively called aphasias, that arise from damage to language uh, processing uh, in the human brain. Okay, let's finish up uh, with three um, model systems. So there's, there are a lot of nice uh, model systems in the auditory uh, modality as in other sensory modalities, uh, two of which uh, have been studied uh, seminally here by Mark Kunishi's lab in biology. So it's worth knowing about them. One is uh, these little guys, zebra finches, not to be confused with zebra fish. Uh, these are songbirds. So if you, some of you may have these as pets or have heard them. So they make complex auditory um, songs that they, used for, that they use for social communication. And if you look at their brains, as people in Mark Kanishi's lab uh, and many other people have done, you find that their brains look pretty different than other bird brains. So the brain of like a pigeon or something is shown up here. It's not a songbird. And that has auditory, um, so remember these are birds, they're not mammals, and so they don't have a cortex. They have instead these nuclei in the brain. So all birds have some nuclei for making some sounds, some nuclei for hearing, so they can hear, but they don't sing and they, they can't process the complex uh, songs that birds make. By contrast, if you take a look at a zebra finch brain, it has a system known as the song system that consists of a bunch of separate nuclei, all shown here with all these weird letters here that you don't need to know about in detail. But the point is that there's a very specialized circuitry, somewhat analogous to the kind of specialized circuitry that you find in the human brain and cortex for processing language. And there are actually a lot of similarities, which is one reason why people have studied songbirds, between how songbirds learn to sing and how human babies learn to talk. So just like human babies need to be able to hear a language, and then they need to practice that language by babbling, and only then are they able to start speaking, you find the same thing in songbirds, that they need to listen to a tutor song, so if you don't hear any song, they will not be able to produce a proper song on their own. They need to hear a template from their own species. So they hear other birds sing when they're babies. So when they, when they, when they hatch, they can't sing yet. They have to learn this. And initially, there's just a sensory period. They're listening to other birds' songs. Then they produce song, but it's not very good yet. It's like babbling an infant. So they practice, and presumably one functionally one thing that happens is that what they they hear their own song and what they put out is compared to what it is that they hear other birds singing and they try and reduce the mismatch or the error between the two so eventually 
in this crystallized period, they then can sing their own song, just like we can speak a understand and speak a language. And in some cases, it's a little more complicated. In Canaries, for instance, this can happen seasonally. Um, there's lots of really interesting things you can do because in many of these bird species, the male birds make songs that are different uh, or only sing and the females don't. But you can convert a female bird's brain into a male bird's brain and make it able to sing if you give the female bird testosterone. It's a sex steroid early in development. So there's lots of int very interesting uh, manipulations you can do on this model system that illustrates the plasticity in development uh, of vocal learning. And here's just spectrograms of the sounds they make. Uh, let me skip these parts. Here, one thing that's interesting, as in the visual system, remember that in higher order visual cortex, we found regions in the temporal lobe that responded to very complex stimuli, like faces, that had to be synthesized for more simple representations in primary visual cortex. And you find the same thing in the brains of these songbirds. If you put an electrode in to one of these nuclei of the song system, and you play the bird various sounds, you find neurons that only re respond best to the bird's own song. They don't respond to the song when it's reversed. They don't respond to songs from other birds. They respond just to the own, own song best. So it's a very highly selective uh, stimulus response properties for encoding socially meaningful uh, sounds. Second model system also studied here at Caltech by Mark Kranichi and now again by many other people in the world is the auditory system of the barn owl. This one has been studied in particular for how animals localize sounds in space. So remember, I was telling you, you need to compare sounds between the two ears to localize them. Barn owls can do that extremely well, so well that they can um, actually uh, find a sound source, like a little mouse that's rustling, even without any visual input. So they can do this in total darkness if you train them in a room. Um, and the way that they do that is by comparing the timing of sound, timing and intensity be, of sounds between the two ears. I won't go into the details, there's just one bottom line uh, point to make. Mark Kranichi and Eric Knudsen here at Caltech uh, discovered in the uh, avian analog uh, of the uh, inferior colliculus what they, uh, a, a map of auditory space. So there are neurons there. There's a midbrain map here, a brainstem map of auditory space such that if you have a neuron here and a neuron there and a neuron there, as you march across the tissue in the brain, you find that these neurons have spatially restricted auditory receptive fields, just like in the visual system. So you have a spatial topography. These neurons only fire if there's a sound coming from a particular location in space. There's no information in the cochlea that provides that map. There's a, t there's a tonotopic map of frequency, but there's not a map of space. So this is an example of a map, maps something out there in the world, the location of sounds in space, that can only be centrally synthesized. So the brain generates this map. It's not carried forward from the receptor epithelium, as is the case, for instance, in the visual system. So it's a nice illustration of a map, and it shows you that maps are not just sort of a consequence, a byproduct of the fact that you have maps at the periphery, but there's some computational reason to have them because the brain will generate them even when they're not there at the periphery. Very last system, just in one minute, um, are bats, though those have not been studied here, but in many other places. So bats, as you know, are not birds, they're mammals, they have cortex, and they're really unique. Uh, in their auditory system, they make these ultrasonic, put out these ultrasonic pulses, and then use the echoes of those to fly around at night and hunt uh, and so forth. And uh, there are a lot of interesting things about how they do that. Uh, they, again, as you might expect, they use, so this is just an example of the sound frequency over time. So they put out these little pips at very high frequencies in a, in a sonar pulse, and then they listen to the echo coming back. The delay of the echo, how long it takes from when they put out the sound to when it comes back, gives them information about how far away a tree or a moth or something is. The shift of the frequency of the echo relative to the emitted sound, which they also hear, gives them information about how fast they're coming up on that target. Uh, and then there's lots of other spectrally complex information that actually gives the bat information about the shape of an object, 
uh, how fast a moth is beating its wings, so bats are able to discriminate just from the echoes what kind of a moth they're coming up on, what it looks like, and whether it's good to eat or poisonous. The way that they do that, to just end, uh, and you should maybe have guessed this by now, is by making <clears throat> many different functional maps in their auditory cortex. So this schematizes, this is a flattened representation of bat cortex. These are anatomical dimensions in the brain, anterior posterior ventral dorsal, and they've mapped in all these different colors here different parts of cortex that have maps of different auditory cues. They're frequency modulated maps, they're constant frequency maps, there's a region of auditory cortex that overrepresents 60 kilohertz, which is like an auditory fovea, where the bat gets the most information from its echoes. So it begins to look extremely similar to what we saw in the visual system. There are many different uh, regions of cortex. Each of them process different kinds of cues, and they do so in a topographic and orderly way in order to represent those cues explicitly. Okay, so think about these, and... Uh, uh, then we'll take a look at our last sensory systems, the uh, somatosensory system on Wednesday.